social responsibility as an entrepreneur, effective altruism. And we've got Chelsea Rastrum here with us, and then Jonathan and Alex Petridis. Thank you guys for joining. Thanks. Um, well, it's a topic maybe not too familiar with many, so I'm going to let the guys say a few words on, on their views and what it is, define it, kind of. Uh, shall we start from the lady? Or yeah. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> So you guys pieces. chose altruism yeah. over finance. Good job. Yay. <laughs> well done. Hey everybody, I am Chelsea Rustrum and I came from San Francisco and I think about and write about the sharing economy. I wrote a book titled It's a Shareable Life, which is a practical guide to the sharing economy. And my thinking has definitely evolved from how do we share assets, time, and resources to how do we actually share value in companies and create a community from the ground up and effectively build altru altruism and social responsibility to the very fabric of how we build a business. What was the question? Was that a question? <laughs> actually, yeah. actually, it's good. Introductions. Yep, introductions, yeah. Great, you know, introduce. You know, no. Yeah, yeah, that's actually better. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, so I'm Jonathan, um, and I'll let my brother introduce himself separately. I am the founder of All Plants, um, which I was talking about earlier. I've spent the last kind of 10 years trying to find ways to apply uh, the vast scale that you can achieve through technology and through business models uh, to solve what I see at the time, or uh, even still now, as big intractable social problems. Uh, and, I, and I really believe in uh, the power of entrepreneurship um, and of innovation to solve massive global problems. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to build a few of those things uh, successfully and many of them have failed, many, many, way more. Um, the ones that are still living and breathing today, uh, the first was a mobile bank which took me to Kenya uh, where we built an application that allows normal people to uh, both save money and take loans through their very basic handsets and to do that in very small increments which for people living on low incomes uh, can have a very big impact. Um, so that's still being used today across East Africa. Then uh, try to again apply a private business model approach to solving for healthcare, which for most of us in Europe, we don't think of something as a uh, that you would expect to pay for unless you're going super premium. Uh, in Africa, 99% of healthcare consumed is done so as a pay for service. There's very little public provision. And so it's a market-driven economy. And the problem that we saw and that we decided to try and solve was that it was a very fragmented uh, market for the majority of families in Kenya, where the quality was all over the place and very unreliable and it was leading to awful health outcomes. So we thought, well, basically we can try and build a very reliable, repeatable and friendly version of that, kind of like a Starbucks of healthcare. Um, and that's, and that's uh, still going and the fact that it has a business model and makes it very very modest uh, margin once the clinics have actually been running for a few years has allowed us to galvanize the capital we require to build that um, scale model and i'll let al talk about uh, all plants go on don't worry um so all plants we you might have heard earlier so we we deliver uh, delicious plant-based food across the uk to people's doorsteps um, it's, it's ready made so people can eat it whenever they want and the idea is that not only is it delicious but it's also healthy and we believe and it's the kind of the science is really really clear that it's the best way for us to eat as a planet. It's, it's more sustainable um, and for countless other reasons it's the best way for people on the planet to thrive together is that we all eat a more plant based diet. Um, so that's, that's really kind of the social ambition behind what we're doing is how can we find ways to excite people through flavour and through our service to, to eat better for, for people and planet. Um, previous to this, I spent five years uh, building a popcorn company, so completely random and, and seemingly uh, unnecessary in the world. But what we were doing there, as well as, as, well as kind of getting from a kitchen table uh, in Camden to selling three million packs every month across Europe, um, in, in 11 countries, is we were trying to, again, find really what great ways to help people make better choices 
through getting a really tasty snack that also just happens to be healthy to people's hands as conveniently as possible. Um, and that's something I spent five years doing, had a lot of fun with. Um, and actually, the reason I'm interested to talk on this panel today is because what I find most difficult there was doing business well, um, because it's all well and good, you know, finding healthier ways for people to eat or um, getting people to drive more energy efficient cars or whatever it might be, right? That's, that's good for the world in, in some capacity, but it's really, really tough to do business well. And there's so many different theories and different practices about how to best do that. Um, and I came across lots and lots of hurdles when I was growing the popcorn business with the guys who are still doing it. Um, and one really, really interesting example is uh, packaging, because popcorn really relies on a low moisture level uh, in the air that it's packed in so that it, it stays fresher longer, it doesn't go stale. Um, and to find any kind of packaging that can go not allow the, the moisture level in the outside air in that's also recyclable is mm. pretty much impossible. It doesn't exist at the moment. There are, there's really early um, innovation around it. Um, a lot of stuff happening in Israel with the same materials, which is awesome. We, we, we were testing that and still are. Um, but it's really tough. And, and one thing that I found difficult, uh, along with a lot of other elements, was we're making three million packs a month, and where's all that packaging going? And as I said at the beginning, you know, is it that important to make popcorn? Perhaps not. But, it, but at the same time, we have made a lot of people happy, we've made a lot of people eat healthier, and we, we, we've encouraged people to try a healthier way to live, so it's a stepping stone to perhaps a more idealistic way to eat. Um, but now we've dived in right at the deep end, and we're, we're making it as sustainable as possible, and we're working with the best chefs in the country to make it as delicious. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit on me and what we're up to. Yes, thanks. Very good introduction, guys. So, Alex, let me start with you. I guess social welfare and having something sustainable is related to being actually socially responsible from what you've done. How would you, how would you relate the two kind of concepts of, uh, of sustainability and social welfare to the um, social responsibility? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about social responsibility just before we came on here um, and how it's really great that companies now almost feel <laughs> that they have to plug it into what they're doing. <laughs> but the really big problem we face is that for most, of the, for most companies, and most of the time, that is just a marketing opportunity or a way to settle um, what is otherwise a, a business that doesn't have many more practices or values that they, they, they kind of uh, churn through each day. Um, and what's really great about new businesses that are being built is that everyone's starting to feel a little bit more um, responsible for what they're doing and the innovation's there to actually, that there's a, so, so many frameworks of ideas to build that right into the core mission of the business. And I think that's what we're really excited about doing. Um, you know, we, we've said these, this is what we stand for, this is what we're about, and now it's just about um, making that live through every single thing we do. Um, and that is everything from making sure that our packaging um, is fully recyclable or is reusable, which is you know, even, even better, um, to making our team and our community that's built around mm. uh, both our customers and those who actually make the food and those who do the marketing and whatever they do, um, really, really involved in the mission, whether that's from a financial viewpoint or just from a, uh, just making them really core to what we do from like a, a recipe development or, or anything um, because we think that the most important thing we have as people is community um, mm. and that if we can all encourage one another to, to live in a, in a more kind of uh, progressive uh, collective way then we can hopefully encourage that positivity to reflect and thrive around the world. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying a little bit earlier, I think that community can actually be built in from the very beginning of a company, and this can be built into the actual model of the company, and that's kind of what I talk about now, is how, how to move from a sharing economy to a shared economy, which I'll be speaking about tomorrow. 
But the idea is that your stakeholders, your, your users, your employees, your members can actually all be equity owners and owners of the company as the company grows and uh, has a higher value and maybe is eventually sold, right? So if you could extrapolate this across any, any, any business in the economy at this point, um, it's, it's basically this idea of instead of having a marketing department or an HR department say, hey, like, let's do something good for our employees or for the world, it's building that, very, that, that into the model itself and saying your community is your business. So how do you do that? There's a few different ways. There's, at the very grassroots level, there's something called platform cooperativism, which is basically, take a company like Uber, it would make their drivers actually owners of the company and give them like governance, say. So this you know, multi-billion dollar company where the drivers are actually using their own vehicles and their own time would be owners of that company. Another example would be something like uh, equity crowdfunding, where maybe you have a company and you already have 5,000 users, and you actually get those users to invest in the company. They're already invested, so they continue to invest with their money and their time and their effort and their energy and whatnot. So it's actually thinking about how do you how do you how do you distribute that value that's being created in a company and not think about yourself as being socially responsible is like an add-on thing that you do. All that, that happens all the time in the Silicon Valley as well, and we can get into that a little bit later. There are a few ways that are interesting to do that, but um, yeah, I'll stop it. I don't have anything uh, different to add, but something I really like about uh, what I've heard Chelsea talking about uh, regarding this sharing of value as opposed to just the sharing economy applied to my apartment, or my car, um, or my toolbox, as I recently saw one of the sharing economy startups does, um, is that, I don't know about you guys, but for me, one of the biggest failures of uh, capitalist Western economics mm. is the concentration of capital, uh, and the way that that has, in the last, particularly the last 20 years, only accelerated. And you know, we hear everyone talking about the 1%, uh, and the Occupy movement, um, and you know, I, I, it's something that deeply worries me, and it deeply worries me at a societal level, but also as an entrepreneur, because the expected model of value creation is that the capital providers, so any of the investors who you choose to bring into your venture, as well as the um, entrepreneurs, should basically monopolize any value that you create in the in the in the venture, yeah, right. And so, and, and it's and it's very unusual for anyone to apply a model where everyone benefits actually, and it, and, and, and not in a token way, but truly everyone benefits. Uh, and it's hard that way. It's something that at Pender Health, uh, because we're building a retail service business, which is very people heavy. From the very beginning, we always said every single staff member, be they um, the cleaner, be they the receptionist, be they the clinicians, etc. We want them to have shares in the company. Uh, and I'll tell you how hard it is, I'm interested to hear what Chelsea has to say about this. It's so hard um, that, that we found we can't do it. And that wasn't without trying. We, we actually gave everyone shares. And so the salary they had, everyone was earning shares in the company. And no one really cared. Because it, like, it's, they're just like, well, when is this ever going to be worth anything? It's like almost like so uh, nebulous and irrelevant. Um, I don't really care. And actually, we, we allow our staff to vote and decide whether to keep doing the share program or whether to move to a typical uh, quarterly bonus model. And they chose the latter. So I think I really think that finding models to fix uh, the concentration of capital problem would be awesome. But I just think it's quite hard. Do you want to that graph? As well. I think also how you govern a company uh, parlays into that, right? So how much say so you give employees or maybe even your customers into decision making also kind of draws people in and helps them understand like this isn't my company, this is our company. This isn't a company, this is a community. 
you know, it, it's, it's kind of how you generate the culture and you make people feel as much as it is the structure, and one informs the other. And the reason that I care about this in the first place is because I think our transactional economy is eating our personal relationships in a way. So how we do business is how we do life. And if we're doing life in a value extractive way, guess what? That's how we're doing relationships. Alex, something like that. Yeah. Um, I've got a more generic question, and that's how do you actually pick a cause to focus on and, and focus your efforts on? Yeah, Where do you start from? <laughs> it, I think that's, that's a really hard thing. I know that my brother, who talked about this in a second, has, has been trying to find the right fit. Um, and I, I think what it comes down to is why does anyone do anything? Um, because mm. There has to be a certain layer before you apply any of these theories on social social responsibility, altruism, whatever it is. There's a certain layer of well, why do we do what we do? Why do we get out of bed in the morning? As my brother spoke about earlier, and everyone has different beliefs for what that is. I think that you know the reason we do what we do is we're just trying our best to be as as best versions of ourselves as we can be. Um, and how I kind of process that personally is that I, I, I kind of balance three reasons for doing things. Um, so I do things for uh, opportunity. I'm trying to learn or I'm trying to uh, do something because um, I think it, it could take me somewhere. Or I do things to fulfill my passion and my, my creativity. Um, and that could be anything from, uh, you know, I write music to, uh, to, to designing new recipes or you know, building an amazing community of people, I find that really creatively stimulating. And the third reason I do anything is because I, I do need some financial stability to to survive. We all do. That's you know, as whatever it, you know, if it's good or bad, commerce is what our, our world is based around, and give and take is, is a necessity if you want to survive in some capacity. So those three reasons, which I could you know, passion, um, opportunity, and money, are really why I do anything. Um, now, to find the cause, I think, is about deeply searching and exploring for a way to balance those three in a way that you're passionate about, you're constantly affording yourself new opportunity, new learning, and at the same time, you're finding a way to be financially secure. And you know, if you can then create value for others and, and you can create value for the world in a really effective way, <laughs> which we'll talk about in a bit, then that's amazing as well. Um, but yeah, those, those, those are my three kind of uh, watch outs. So if I'm t not, if I'm tipping one way or the other, then I'm not I'm not balanced enough, and perhaps it isn't the right course. Um, but but I think it's a constant exploration, and uh, it's a really interesting thing to to learn about because ultimately you learn more about yourself through it, which is yeah, great. <laughs> I have a less structured approach. Um, <laughs> I would say whatever it is that you're up to, uh, align the, whatever cause that is with your mission. You know, um, figure out what that is and parlay that into whatever cause you might choose. I also choose what causes I care about and contribute to based on how I feel, frankly, and that might involve just feeling socially, <laughs> say, socially responsible, a social responsibility for something. For example, right before I was here, I was actually at Standing Rock. Um, I don't know how many of you know, how many of you know what's going on at Standing Rock? Whoa, crazy. <laughs> Once we get to. Uh, I don't need to get fully into that, but I'm happy to have conversations with you guys um, later about that. But it's basically a pipeline that's going in to North Dakota in an indigenous area, and there are seven different police departments fighting indigenous people who are peacefully protesting on their own land. So that has to do with you know climate change, and it has to do with how we treat the planet, how we treat each other, etc. So yeah, I, I guess I choose my causes um, based on alignment with my own values and moving forward from that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, if, if Chelsea's is a little bit unstructured, mine's a complete mess in terms of how I approach this. 
um, so far in my career. And I guess the the thing that uh, has happened for me, quite simply, is I've just thrown myself at whatever problem sits in front of me and seems and feels uh, big enough to be worth trying to solve. Uh, and I think the one thing that I didn't hear uh, Chelsea or Alex talk about, that certainly for me is really important, is that I feel like I can actually have a really big impact on it. Mm. Um, because, mm -hmm. and, and, and that goes, if you forget about the social responsibility thing for a second, and that just goes for like startup ideas, for example. I've had tons of startup ideas that like, there's no way I could ever be the right person to build that. Um, so you've got to know what you are capable of based on both your skills and your network and your uh, the team around you, like who do you know who could actually help make this happen, etc. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, been a natural filter for me. Um, the other thing that we were talking about earlier is that there's, there's also quite a, a movement, and this is where the phrase effective altruism actually comes from, uh, towards taking a far more cold and calculated, it sounds sinister, um, approach to considering which causes to support. And that doesn't just mean in terms of, you know, being a uh, prominent politician or an entrepreneur um, or a researcher trying to push or move massive problems. One of the big things that the effective altruism movement advocates for is that a lot, of, for a lot of people, the best way for you to maximise your personal impact on the world might be to go and pursue that big city career and become a really successful, high-paying uh, lawyer or banker or what have you. And, well, you know, there, there, are, there are rewards for that in our and world that's... currently, and that the system works like that. And you can choose to uh, yield those rewards from the current system and then pledge and, and you know, give a significant amount of your income, because let's face it, no one needs two or three hundred thousand dollars a year salary, let alone millions, right? And so you can say, hey, okay, actually, I, my skills and my network and my past is, is, is empowering me to go and smash it and become a, the, the hotshot barrister or lawyer or whatever. And actually, then I'm going to be able to use that to support and impact some of the biggest problems in this planet. Um, so I, I just think it's a really, it's an interesting thing where it's like, okay, maybe I can feel like I'm pursuing uh, a great path if I, if I choose to go down that path too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So this is sort of what uh, all of you sort of say. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about how uh, this the world seems to focus on a transactional value of, of social of social response of the way the world works. And I'm wondering, instead of perhaps trying to change an entire culture of how we do things, if you actually put a tra transactional value on on being Social, socially responsible, let's say, would that be something that could bridge the gap, or is that completely impossible to do? Can you give an example of how that might work? Yeah, all right. Let's say um, they, when they started talking about the carbon footprint, right? Um, just a random, uh, random example. <laughs> yes, they started saying that we should all have a smaller carbon footprint, but there were no implications for it, right? Whether or not you had a small carbon footprint, or you were the guy that flew a private jet everywhere, yeah. uh, the implications on your day-to-day -day life were the same. So I wonder whether a metric like that, if you somehow incorporate it into, into everyday life. So just a random example, let's say the, high, the higher your carbon footprint, it affects the tax that you pay. Yeah. Something completely random. Would that help bridge the gap? And would people be able to understand a bit, bit better what they need to do, or is the whole point that it comes from the heart and that it's not a transactional sort of uh, thing? I think it has to be both, right? It needs to be both analytical and feeling-based. Um, we are a heart-mind, hopefully they're connected. <laughs> so we were actually talking about this before, this idea that I had about putting value on everything out there, like a gallon of gas or a pound of corn or whatever else it is, and looking at what it what that actually costs, including spillover costs, 
um, in terms of the value of that and maybe government subsidies, et cetera. And you know, looking across everything at what that actually looks like. You're gonna add on that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the main way to do that is through taxing things correctly. But to do that, you requires a government that are gonna just lose all public uh, support for everything. If, if you if you actually look at um, meat, I'm vegan. We're we're all vegetarian. Um, so I'll if, them. if if you look at if you look at meat and you price the hamburger in the way that it uh, costs the planet, you'd be paying two hundred pounds or two hundred euros for a burger. And everyone would be in a state. Damn. Yeah, kebab would be very difficult to buy. Okay. Um, so, so the, so the thing is, it's it's such it's so embedded in our system that I believe the only way to do it is through creating disruptive, uh, through disruptive startups, disruptive businesses that actually challenge what we're doing um, and find new ways to solve the problems in a way that meets what people actually want but serves them slightly differently so that we're actually creating a cultural change through business and through service um, because that's a really scalable way at then creating a public uh, understanding, education, and, and, and a public uh, wave of kind of acceptance if we were then to impose things like, okay, maybe we should tax this slightly harder, or or, you know, little differences like that, but it starts with the people. It, it is an emotional thing, but it also starts with giving them the options to make the better emotional decision, um, which is, is essentially, I think, the role of a business, of a startup especially. It used to be the role of government. <laughs> it used to be the role of government, okay. You can talk about that if you want. Um, so, um, what, what, what Alex and I have dedicated <laughs> ourselves to is trying to provide better options. Uh, and that's because we believe in the simple rules of behavioral economics, which show that unless you actually make something uh, so easy that it almost becomes a default option, right. they're not going to change their behavior. Um, now, that's what we do. Personally, what I believe is, I would love to see systemic change uh, at the policy level of all governments around the world. Yeah. I think that the way that we would drive the most drastic change that actually required to come anywhere near hitting our climate goals of only incurring a two degree increase in the, in the temperature of this planet by 2050, anywhere close to that would, would, be with, would be with massive and drastic taxation of all things that are producing the crazy amounts of pollution, greenhouse gases, etc. Um, now it's not going to happen to the level it needs to, but there are models where it's happening and it's even happening um, for example, in, in the UK with electric cars versus um, petrol and diesel cars. If you have the cash to buy a Tesla today, the running costs are insanely cheap. Uh, you, don't pay, you, you don't pay for a tax disc every year. You don't pay, so no road tax. You don't pay congestion charge, for example, to get in and out of London. Uh, you don't pay for fuel, right? You go and plug it in at three stations. All over, the, all over the town. Now, right now, it's a massive hassle because there's not many places you can charge and it costs around $80,000 uh, pounds uh, for the current model. But the cool thing is that this is just the beginning on that technology, right? Um, and on the infrastructure to support it. And we think, and for us, we want to do the same with food. Um, now, uh, you know, for, for example, we've got friends who, are, uh, who have built a new drinks brand to, but they want, they want to substitute for Coca-Cola, which, let's face it, is basically feeding our children, who are their main target for their marketing and their branding, uh, poison. You know, they're, they're feeding them pure sugar and caffeine, which is insane. It's like, from a health and wellness perspective, it's awful. And the cost to society that's then borne by, for example, in the UK, the NHS, so it's paid by everyone, is enormous. But Coca-Cola make profit with their products, right? Our friend has launched a brand called Ugly Drinks. They make delicious, um, refreshing canned drinks, same size, super cool branding like Coke, zero sugar, zero caffeine, zero anything bad. Um, now the cool thing is that, again, there has been systemic change 
come into place is very, very minimal, uh, but there's a sugar tax that's going to be implemented in the next 12 months, I believe, which is, which is going to start nudging people, even with a few, like 20, 30 pence additional cost on Coca-Cola, towards the new options. So we kind of have to work together, I think, to achieve the change. From the policy perspective, in a few different places right now, in the US and I believe New Zealand, uh, nature is getting personhood, which means that, yay, which means that, uh, yeah, it can, and corporations can be sued for attacking the earth, basically. <laughs> it's a really big deal, yeah. It's basically, it means, so as in New Zealand, right? New Zealand and there's a few communities in the U.S. that are are pushing for that. Actually, some really really young people who are saying, you know, this is my future. You're screwing up the planet. Like we're going to sue the government, basically. So this is, and so that is all of these systemic changes are about forcing. And by the way, we should definitely be focusing all of this efforts in politics on uh, implementing the costs to corporations. Individuals can come later, but we should corporations have got so many externalized costs and they're stripping profit and they're concentrating capital constantly every single day. If, if we can find ways to start to take those external costs, like uh, wastewater out of a factory that, that pollutes the water, kills all of the fish, kills all of the local um, flora and fauna, it's an enormous cost on the planet. If they pay for that, then they'll change their practices and they'll adapt. It won't, it's not like the factory will shut down, they'll just do things better. It's fine. Well, they'll shut down a lot, but they'll restart with probably other things, right? <laughs> yeah, let's do questions. Let's, yeah, let's do Kenny. Yeah. Okay, so I had a lot of questions throughout the discussion, but now that we that we got into like this subject, like the policy one, I'm, I'm asking Chelsea because she's like, coming directly from San Francisco, but also talking to the other guys. How important it is right now that the president like believes, oh, I mean, it's an obvious question, <laughs> but he believes that climate change is a hoax. I mean, we don't have the problem in Europe because we've kind of accepted that and kind of work towards finding a solution. But when the leader of the free world, let's say, says these things, it kind of affects other countries as well. So how do you think it's going to affect, you know, the, let's say the future of these efforts that we're trying to have? <sighs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a long one. Maybe it's a long one. No, it's a yeah, really good question. I mean, it's a great question. It's just so loaded, you know? It's, oh. I mean, you say the free world, I don't know how free it is when we've got corporations that are super intermixed with government and policy and everything else. Um, it's, it's a travesty as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but it's also, I think, the optimistic part of me wants to believe it's, it's reason for political uprising and for citizens to get involved again and say, hey, that's not happening in my backyard. We're not doing this. Um, and I think if Hillary was elected, it might just be more business as usual. And so this is potentially an opportunity for the US and the world to really rethink like what is our collective purpose? Like and what are we doing together? And, and, and what does it mean to be a great country? Not just using taglines, but actually decide what great means. <laughs> um yeah, I mean it's it's deeply saddening that that's happened and that he has appointed also, a uh, head of climate change who rejects it um, as, as an issue. But we all have voices, we all make choices, and we all have the ability to create change. And, and that's, I think, more true today than it has ever been before. Um, and that is what we have to totally believe when we do uh, live and breathe in a, in a social environment that our message, our product, our insights conference wherever it is can talk to people all over the world and, and it's so important going back to the idea of community that we keep building a community of people who do believe in climate change who understand it and who want to make an impact at collect, collecting everyone together and everyone's ideas and making that change possible 
Um, but it's really tough. And and the, you know, yes, in the US there's been a horrible amount of disenfranchisement, but we've we've had Brexit as well in the UK, which sucks. And it and it shows that there's people who don't really care about or don't really understand. Uh, or feel separated from perhaps the problems that we've been looking at, and uh, because there were so many problems for themselves, um, and ultimately, as we were getting to earlier on the matter of uh, why you pick a certain cause, we're all there's, it's all for we're all on our personal journeys before we're anything else. Um, so, but we just have to shout louder. We have to do more. We have to do more that matters. Going back to um, my brother's talk earlier, and believe that we can still work together as a community and keep helping our planet thrive through things like personhood and through things like Tesla and what we're trying to do, or all plants, which is just, you know, our little way of, of trying to make an impact. You know, hopefully it will be big, but it's our little way at the moment. The, I only got two little things to add to what the guys said, which I completely agree with. One is that we shouldn't allow the fact that one idiot has called this massive global threat to the survival of humanity on this planet uh, a hoax. Um, we shouldn't let that affect us at all. Because to be honest, who knows whether he actually believes it. You can't even say he believes it. He said it, but he says the majority of things just for fun, it seems, right? So who gives a crap about what he says? It is going to mean that they'll probably slow down on and or even start to try and turn around a lot of progressive programs that were planned and hence uh, individuals and um, in, in independent organisations, be they not-for-profit or for-profit, need to fill that gap. But the, the exciting thing is that you've got, for example, China, the biggest and fastest growing economy in the world, calling him out and saying, OK, hang on, we're worried about this moron. He's calling climate change a hoax. We believe in it. China are the first major country in the world to commit to reducing the consumption of meat by 2030, by 50%. This is in an economy, guys, where the majority of people are just coming into out of super, super lower middle uh, working class, into middle class, which typically drives massive increase shift in diets towards meat, towards dairy, etc. They're saying, no, no, we, don't. we realize the impact of the world this is having. We realize if we're going to deliver on our commitments for China to deliver to, to uh, be part of the coalition against global warming, that we're going to have to reduce meat consumption. So they're sat there saying, no, no, we're, we're still on this path. We're going to make it happen. So let's not worry too much about this moron, and let's just carry on with what we're doing. Well, not I also think Brexit and the recent presidency point to a great division in our populations, and it's servicing what's already there. And if we're ever going to find unity, we have to we have to feel and see the problems that are right in front of us. And there's there's a lot, and we need to deal with we need to deal with these things. So. Uh, hi guys. Um, hi. So. Uh, <laughs> Continuing on the systemic change topics, as I said, um, I mean, we were talking about policy again. And we're, uh, you guys can hear me? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. You, you I was trying to see. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, I have lots of questions, but I'll try to focus on one, which is so, policy. We want to change something, we want to, to make our voices heard, and so on. What we don't hear from guys like you, I think, and um, no, talking about guys like you, because I see that you guys are doing excellent things, I mean, inspiring things, and, it's, and this is really important for us as individuals to, to look at you and think, okay, maybe I could do that, maybe I could contribute to that. But what, what at least I don't see, and uh, I've also been trying to look a bit into the effective altruism movement and so on, is basically a disruption and innovation in politics, you know? Mm. I mean, uh, I've also been surprised by findings that non-civil resistance is actually much more effective than one might think you know, by watching TV and so on. Uh, but it just feels like there's so much more. And I'd like to know your opinion on what we should do or, or you know, how to get on that, or how to start politics disruption. That's it. 
I think if we're going to be truly innovative, we have to actually start thinking about how to move things on the policy level. Um, as entrepreneurs, as startups, as technologists, we need to we need to not just be thinking about replicating what already exists, but generating an entirely restructured economy. So yes. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, there's. It's, and, and in some ways, the, the lack of clear channels through which we are able to get behind things that we believe in is really frustrating and is disempowering. Because it's like, well, I don't, like, yeah, I care about this, but what do I do? I'm going to donate to Greenpeace, or I'm going to, like, okay, I, I, I've chosen to change the way I eat personally because I believe that you can't be, you can't believe in the threat to our environment and our, and our planet through climate change, and, and then at the same time say you're going to be, you know, meat and dairy because the impact has. So I've changed that very personally. But how can I, if, if I believe the government should uh, create these taxes to systemically adjust corporations' behaviour, what do I do? Um, and yeah, and there are some amazing both technology-based and other-based uh, disruptive platforms being developed for. Uh, collaborative democracy, where all, for example, there's a city in Argentina, Rosario, where they put the entire budget uh, online, and everyone gets to vote about how the budget is allocated. Uh, that's called open democracy. You know, and these things are very nascent, and we'll see how they work and whether they work. Um, I guess for me, the way that, because I feel disempowered and I don't know how to drive change for us in the UK, in Whitehall, in Parliament, I don't know, if my vote feels irrelevant, the, the, the choice of parties are both completely incompetent and, by the way, don't give a crap about any of the things that I think need to change, and if I vote for the parties who do care about that, they're going to get one seat out of 600. So for me, that's, I, I, I believe deeply in the power of uh, the capitalist model in terms of allowing us to provide people the opportunity to make a different choice. Because we as customers, the one thing I believe that's good about capitalism is that it gives me and you guys and everyone in here the power to choose the world we want to live in by what we choose to use and do and where we choose to go every day. Um, so, it, not too utopian, but I really believe that we can choose and, it, and it's up to the entrepreneurs and the investors to build those new, better options that, that can improve the world, if that's a faster way to fix the problem than politics, which feels uh, pretty slow moving right now. Before we, because I, I want to add on, on this um, topic, so you can respond based on this question as well. When, okay, we, we talked about the policy level, and then, oh, oh, Having choices is great, but if we go down grassroots, as Chelsea said, and we find out that actually people don't even consider, let's say, the basic things like recycling being important, mm -hmm. how do you put that in the mix, given the fact that they do have choice and they choose not to do it? So how do you kind of empower them to put everything in the mix, not just eating, because being vegan and then like throwing plastic everywhere doesn't do good. But just recycling and just eating meat when you know that if you like stay out of meat like for a day per week would be so cost efficient and so energy efficient. So when you go like deep down, even in a country this small, it's so easy to let's say mobilize people. It's still so hard to make them understand when they have a choice why to pick the say mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. Touching on what you said about voting, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, yeah, we vote every day to the choices we make. So if we're making good choices, then we can, we can totally uh, establish a better way of living. But to actually get people to make those choices is really, really, really difficult. And I, even on a personal level, I find it, and no one's perfect, right? I find it difficult to always make the right choice because we, 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 we spoke about earlier. Um, we're actually overwhelmed by choice. There's, there's, there's so many choices we're making every day. There's, the average adult makes 35,000 choices a day. Like how do you then direct them in a way to do things better? 
and that is just really hard. And, and I, I, you know, this, the politicians are there to guide public interest in a way that uh, the people that they govern uh, want. So they're, they're like, like Trump, they're just playing the polls, like Hillary, they're just playing the polls and understanding what they need to do to get uh, into power and to serve people as best that the people want. But it all starts with what the people want. And so we're talking about making better products for people, but it's also about inspiring people and educating people. And to do that, it's all three. It's inspiration, education, and solutions. Um, solutions are, are the hardest thing to do, and people are trying to do stuff all over the world to create better solutions. Um, but that does, it's, it's quicker than uh, changing governments, I think, hope. Um, but it's something that we can all do. But other people's skills are in education, other people's skills are in inspiration, in art, in, in fashion, whatever it might be. And it's through doing those things in a way that make people think and create and, and drive the conscious consumer movement, which is really nascent and growing. And that is something we should feel really passionate about. And I, I share your kind of real burning uh, desire for everyone to, to, to try a little bit harder. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a growing movement. And, and as with any cultural shift and any movement over time, it takes a little bit of you know, easing to get the cogs turning. And then it picks up pace and it starts to snowball. And that's what's going to happen. Um, and that's what we're seeing with the whole raft of people doing, like, you know, campaigning for things in a more inspirational way, like Leonardo DiCaprio being the face of this this documentary, like, you know, before the flood. that's great, that's great. He, it's, before the flood is, it's very old. He's telling us a lot of things that we already knew as people who know these things, but he's also managing to inspire people in a way that's way more populist than ever before and way more, uh, you know. Everyone loves fucking Leo. Sorry, my language. <laughs> Everyone loves him. So, so, so it's a great way to advertise, and that's just a way of providing inspiration and education. And if we can constantly, you know, mould inspiration, education, solutions together, then we're going to keep driving the movement. And the, the the tough bit is how do we accelerate it so that on a national level, when it comes to governance. It is the popular thing, and it is the thing that the, that the politicians have to do because people want it. And that is the challenge we face. We're in this kind of middle ground at the moment where there's a, a certain subsect of us who really see it, want it, know about it, are inspired by it. And then there's people who, over the last 20, 30 years, have lost their jobs to China or who have, who have kind of, their whole cultural systems changed. They've seen uh, the few in their country get more powerful and more economically well off and posting about their latest uh, bling on Instagram and they're, and they're eating kind of crap at their table or whatever because that's how they have to live. And so there's this huge imbalance at the moment and we have to find ways to do those three things, inspire, educate and solve to, so that we can keep driving the movement. I just want to add a few things to that. Um, as far as legislature is concerned, I think that's actually a really good way to change cultural behaviors. Um, for example, in North Dakota, they don't recycle <laughs> at all. And that's just crazy to me, um, but they don't. And so in San Francisco, I noticed recently since the election that there's been a little bit of an uprise in terms of citizen participation. And one, um, one thing that's happened is the Sustainable Economy and Law Center out of Oakland has started teaching people policy making, citizen policy making classes. And then also as another resource, uh, Bernie's book, Our Revolution, I think speaks to how we can, as citizens, have a political uprising in all of our own. Good? Yeah, questions? Just a final question for me then. We've talked a lot about um, what kind of actions we should take and how this could create some impact. But I guess the bottom line is how you actually measure it and see if, if you've achieved any result. Oh, boom. And uh, I think Jonathan will go first. <laughs> the measurement of social impact is something that I've grappled with for quite a long time. Um, and I personally believe that I've got two beliefs that, that basically work completely against each other. <laughs> the first belief is that nothing happens unless you measure it. 
Mm. I don't know about you guys, but I'm talking really largely in business. A lot of people find this with, uh, with their own personal goals as well. If you don't write down the goals and you don't measure whether you hit them, be that your conversion rate on your homepage, be that your uh, production targets in your kitchen, mm. or be that your um, average minutes per kilometer when you're training for a marathon, you don't improve. Okay, so I really, really believe in data. I'm a data geek. At the same time, in large that is a massive data geek. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the same time, for example, with Pender Health, we spent the first four years losing money hand over fist because the three of us founders had no idea how to build a medical or health business with no past experience, uh, and we were trying to do something really, really, really hard, like bricks and mortar clinics giving people healthcare, right? So we were losing, losing, losing money. So we had to raise loads of grants, I mean loads of competitions. And a lot of those grants came with conditional requirements. And the majority of them came with impact measurement requirements. And let me tell you, the amount of wasted weeks we had to spend, not just days, weeks, to, provide, to write up the reports to share with the Gates Foundation or share with the MasterCard Foundation or whoever wanted the report that week, uh, it could have been spent much better focusing on our patients. And that's why we always built it with a business model behind it, not a charity model. Because when you're constantly having to do that, you're facing out towards the donors and you're worrying about measuring something in a way for other people as opposed to facing towards your customers and worrying that they love what you're doing and they're getting the benefit. So as a result, in terms of how do you measure your social responsibility, I think a lot of it is a waste of time, despite what I said about the fact that nothing good happens if you measure it. The way that I marry those, like deal with that conflict, is that for me, as a business, being socially responsible means building your entire mission and culture around the social responsibility uh, that you are choosing to take on. And some of the greatest companies having the greatest impact, they don't need to measure how many uh, trees got saved by the fact that they're using a different type of material or how much less carbon footprint their production of food is. By the mere fact that we are choosing to make all of our food from plants, not meat, or dairy or fish, we know that it's 100x better and that's good enough. We don't want to measure it every single day. So anyway, that's my piece. I don't care a lot about this. Yeah, that probably a little bit onto the B Corp, which is what a lot of companies are doing to be quote unquote socially responsible. And I believe there's a couple hundred metrics that are measured annually to maintain the B Corp status. Uh, and is that effective? Maybe. Would it be better to just build a business where all these things are built in and your community is built in from the ground up and your purpose is really, really clear and that's built into every part of your organization? Like I'm sure these guys have an amazing supply chain you buy from fair trade suppliers and <laughs> whatnot. We check. So we should. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so the only, going back to your conflict, Earlier, um, the reason you measure stuff is so that you can make stuff better and so that you can achieve your goals of making stuff better. And I think what we're all touching on um, is just making better things rather than just making things better. So that idea of making better things and then and then putting them putting that thing you're making at the heart of your culture and what you do is, is super important. I personally don't like measuring much. I, I'm very much of, um, I, I like to, no, I, I'm very different in the way that I go about things um, because I'm so passionate about community, I, I try I, I try to kind of, conf I conflict with measurement constantly. Um, and from a social responsibility point of view, I, I agree with these guys. I think you have to build it into the center of what you do. If you don't, then you're just trying to appease someone or you're just trying to use it for marketing, which, which, is, which is fine if you're then inspiring people in some kind of way, but it's not a necessary thing and your time can be spent better. Can I add one more thing? Sure. 
Because one of the other questions we had expected to be asked, because um, it, it should it should be it's a really important one is uh, how easy or hard is it to be socially responsible? Really hard. As a, as a, in any way, like as an individual, or you know, for us as a as a really early stage startup, etc. And I, would, I just want to address the fact that it's really, really, really hard. And we certainly are getting most things wrong most of the time. Um, and I'll and I, I share a couple of those that we are constantly working on. So one of them is um, we long term want everything that we source to be from, uh, to be fully responsibly sourced. Uh, and you know, there's so much more we could do on that. I want to. I wish we had a whole team doing our responsible procurement for all of the ingredients that we bring in. But right now, we're having to prioritise our focus, and we're having to actually just focus on getting the right ingredients, i.e., you know, the aubergines that are freshest, um, or the green lentils at, that we can afford, as opposed to going that next level of making it fully optimised and deliver on the social responsibility mission that we feel that we have. Um, so I, I, I just want to emphasize that it's, it, the pursuit of perfection in this is a constant battle. It's not like, oh, we're, we're perfect, we've got this mission, and so we don't have to worry about it. No, like, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we're constantly noticing things that we wish we could do better, mm -hmm. and trying to reduce our impact, and, try, and actually we, we've got in our um, mission, uh, we're on a mission to be a zero waste company. That's probably going to be an endless pursuit, we're never going to get it's almost impossible, but we'll try. Um, and so I just want to be clear that we're not, there's no opportunity for anyone to be a saint, um, at all for anyone to get it right bang on, but it's uh, important to be making that constant effort. And, that, and it's not just difficult for a startup, by the way. I, I, I don't normally speak on the side of corporates, but it's really difficult if you're a massive business. I'm going to use an example of the supermarkets in the UK. So. They have data that shows them if a uh, fruit or a vegetable is more aesthetically pleasing, more people are going to buy it. That means that they waste tons of fruit and vegetables that aren't the right length or the right shape or the right colour. And more often than not, that stuff just gets thrown in the bin because, oh, how do we give it to the homeless and it's too complicated, forget it. Um, so, and, and there's more and more things that are trying to say, okay, well, we could just, we could use that and we could make the most of it. And again, that's something we're going to bring into our supply chain. But I was at a, a conference the other week um, with, with both sides of this, this point of view. And it, it's a really tricky thing. And I think that's why we're, what we're saying, what we're trying to build, and what the new generation of business is all about, is having a central mission, having a cause, and really making that the thing that your culture is about and the thing that your whole community believe in, so that you can inspire others, so, so you can do more um, better things, and so that you can disrupt the world that is, it is in really difficult um, economic kind of conflict with itself. Mm. Um, and that, yeah, hopefully, if, we, if we're all kind of really pumped about doing that, then we can, we can drive change at, at both the government level and at a day-to-day -day consumer level with how we make choices and how we thrive together as people on the planet. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> 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 <laughs>